I am the Director of Public and Government Affairs here at Dar al Hijra Islamic Center. Uh, welcome if this is your first time. Uh, Dar al Hijra Islamic Center is the first masjid, and Senator Peterson asked me, what's a masjid? Mm -hmm. Masjid is the Arabic word for mosque, and it literally means to a place to prostrate. Uh, so this is the oldest uh, masjid in Northern Virginia, uh, opened in 1983. If you were driving in, the house that you saw uh, was actually the original place of prayer, and then this building uh, was opened in the early 90s. Of course, let's hope so. uh, I'm also the founding board member of MOVE, the Virginia Muslim Chamber, and MAVE, the Muslim American Voter Engagement Project. Uh, and the intent is to further uh, civic education for American Muslim voters, uh, particularly in the Northern Virginia community. Our focus is in uh, Prince William, Loudoun, and Fairfax counties. Uh, this is going to be the second uh, forum that we host, and we're hosting actually several more. Uh, the earlier forum that we hosted was the forum that was for, uh, for uh, Congresswoman Wexton uh, and her uh, opponent, Hung Kao, at the Dara Noor Islamic Center in uh, Manassas, Virginia. We're also going to have candidate forums in Loudoun County and are preparing further candidate forums in Prince William County as we get past the primary season. Uh, now. The masjid is technically not in the Senate district, but uh, we have uh, many folks from our community that are part of the Senate district, uh, whether they live in the Fairfax areas, uh, the Falls Church uh, corridor, uh, as well as the Idlewood uh, corridor that, that is a part of the uh, state Senate district. And this is a new state Senate district, but uh, it was a redistricted, I guess, the, the boundaries were shifted. Uh, tonight, uh, the rules of the um, forum tonight will be as follows. Uh, we will have uh, both candidates uh, essentially have a three-minute opening remarks. And then uh, the, our moderator, uh, who I will introduce in a second, uh, will ask a question of each of the candidates. And each of the candidates will have a minute, 45 uh, seconds to respond. Uh, no rebuttals. This is a forum and not a debate. Uh, so. Uh, we have our timekeeper, uh, Anika Rahman, uh, one of the leadership Fairfax uh, 40 under 40. Um, congratulations. Uh, so Anika will tell the candidates when you're uh, approaching uh, 30 seconds and you're approaching 15 and then time up. Uh, and at the end of the forum, what we'll have is a two minute uh, wrap up, uh, which is kind of final, final remarks, and then we will close. Uh, so our intent is to uh, essentially have our moderator ask uh, several questions. Uh, we will have some community-led questions. Uh, that, so at the, towards when, when the moderator gets through the question, we'll have uh, some of our community members uh, allowed to ask some questions. So who do we have with us tonight? First and foremost, I'm going to introduce uh, our moderator for the evening, um, Tuqa Nusayrat. Uh, Tuqa, can I invite you up here, please? Uh, Tuqa Nusayrat uh, is actually a board member uh, at the Dar al Hijra Islamic Center here. Uh, she is also the Director of Strategy, Operations, and Finance at the Atlantic Council's Rafiq Hariri Center for Middle East Programs. Uh, she joined the Council in 2012 and has played a key role in shaping the direction and growth of the Council's Middle East related programming, publications, outreach, and development and advancing relationships with vital stakeholders, including donors, board members, and high-level contacts. Uh, in addition to managing a team of Washington-based fellows and staff, her research focuses on political reform, civil society, human rights, broadly in the region with a special focus on uh, Jordan. Uh, she worked at the Project on Middle East Democracy and the National Endowment for Democracy, holds a degree in uh, an, a master's degree in foreign service from Georgetown University and BA in government and international politics from George Mason University. Um, also tonight is joining us is uh, State Senator Chap Peterson. He has represented Northern Virginia for the past 16 years as a Democrat state, Democratic State Senator. He grew up in the city of Fairfax, attended Fairfax High School, and graduated from UVA Law School. He entered private practice over the past 29 years, has represented thousands of local citizens and businesses as a lawyer. He lives in Fairfax City along with his wife, Sharon Kim Peterson, and their four children. In 2017, uh, Senator Peterson established his own law firm, Chap Peterson and Associates, near the historic Fairfax County Courthouse, 
and has grown to 14 employees representing many languages and backgrounds. Can we have a welcoming round of applause for Thank Senator Peterson? Thank you. Our other candidate this evening is Mr. Saddam Aslan Salim. He's a first-generation immigrant born in Bangladesh. Uh, Saddam attended Falls Church High School, where he was a track and field athlete, president of his class, and a recipient of the John Morris Athletic Scholarships. He attended Northern Virginia Community College and George Mason University. During his career, Saddam has worked at PenFed Credit Union, Kearney and & Company, and the United States Institute for Peace. Actually, that's where we first met, I believe. Um, and as a financial consultant. Uh, today, Saddam works at 11th Hour Service as a senior consultant advising federal clients. Can we have a round of applause and welcome our candidate, Saddam Salim. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator. And none of the candidates have seen the questions. So our moderator is the only one, neither have I. Our, our moderator is the only one that will be, uh, has chosen the questions. Uh, and then after she finishes, we'll open up to questions from our community members. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate you coming out. And thank you to the candidates for also joining us. Um, let's begin with uh, three minutes of introductory opening remarks, and we'll begin with Mr. Peterson. Okay. And uh, do you mind if I stand up there or just stand up in general? Okay, good evening. I'm Chap Peterson, Virginia State Senator. I want to thank uh, the mosque uh, uh, for having me here. Thank you very much, the moderator and everybody else. Uh, this is a chance to reach out to a unique community that's a little bit new to me. And I see some friends in the audience. Um, <clears throat> I kind of was thinking, what are two themes that I would talk about in my opening statement? And the first one is Ford Motor Company. Uh, Ford Motor Company, you might ask, well, why Ford Motor Company? Well, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and my family. Uh, my father, John Peterson, grew up, his mom was, grew up on a ranch in Oklahoma. My dad grew up in a working class neighborhood outside of Chicago. And he worked his way through college as a trucker. And uh, he was driving a truck, he was working for a moving company. And while he was in college, he did well in school. And he was identified by Ford Motors for a Ford Foundation scholarship. And as a result, he was able to continue his education. He graduated from Northwestern University, went on to the Wharton School of Business, got a PhD in economics, ended up teaching at George Mason and becoming a very significant uh, American economist. But it all came down to the Ford Motor Company saw something in him and they gave him a scholarship, which is why to this day I still drive a Ford. Because one of the things I believe in public life is loyalty. And I believe that they were loyal to my dad and that's something I'll always remember. The other thing is Olive Garden. You know, Olive Garden says when you're here, you're with family. That's where I feel like when I go around the 37th Senate District, I go to churches, I go to synagogues, I go to mosques, I go to all these houses of worship. And I was at the Hindu temple the other day. And no matter where I am, even if I'm not a member of that faith, I feel like I'm amongst family. And so I realize today it's a little bit unique. We're speaking to the Muslim community, not just the same folks that have been going to every debate, but rather the Muslim community. And I do want to talk about three issues, and we're going to get to these during the debate. The first one is religious freedom. Religious freedom was a founding principle of this nation, and I want to talk about that and what it means in 21st century America, where religious believers are actually a minority of the population. Secondly, I want to talk about education and educational attainment. You know, we take it for granted in Northern Virginia that our school system is the best, not only in the state, but in the nation. But we have so much work to do to catch up, not just with learning loss from COVID, but also to make sure a generation of children is brought up with the same level of opportunity that we had. And the last one is protecting small business. You know, so many folks that are here that have come to this nation, they did so for the opportunity to start their own business. Maybe they had an idea. Uh, maybe they had a, a desire to be better than what they could do back in their mother country. And they came here and they started a business. And how we support small business that is really, it's in the DNA of America, it's in the DNA of Fairfax County. So I'm looking forward to speaking about those issues. I'm glad to be here with my, my colleague, Mr. Saleem. Uh, again, uh, this is a debate for the Muslim community to, to hear from your unique issues, and I know we're going to bleed over into other issues, and I look forward to that. And again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I should have said that at the beginning. Uh, but, but thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Take care. It's up to you. 
Um, first of all, assalamualaikum everyone, and you know, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, again, my name is Saddam Salim. I'm running to be your next state senator. I'm running because we need to focus on Virginia's future. It's time for leadership that not only votes, but does something for our communities. We need a public servant, not a public figure. The story of how I got here is why that matters to me. I came to this country due to climate change. My family experienced homelessness. We were able to get affordable housing through Fairfax County's affordable low-income programs. My parents were able to find health care through that same program from community health centers. And that's where my mom's life was saved. And at the same time, my dad found out he was diabetic, and he's been managing that for the last 20 years. I attended Fall Church High School and got a top quality public education from our school system. And I was able to attend colleges, our community colleges, and George Mason University. After college, my family purchased our first home in Falls Church by pulling all of our resources together. For work, I'm a federal consultant for federal agencies. My story is similar to others. We struggled to find the American dream. It was about coming to America, being homeless, finding affordable housing, finding affordable education, and finding affordable health care. Finding a job and then buying a home. We achieved the American dream, but we struggled along the way. Like I said, my parents struggled. They had limited public transportation and worked 10 to 12 hours a day and raised three children in a foreign country that they can eventually call it home. As a first generation immigrant, my story is the story of all of us that are sitting here today. I'm a product of policies Democrats support and continues to fight for today, affordable housing, health care, education, and jobs. Now, I feel it's important for me to give back to the communities that took care of me. And of course, because of my lived experiences, I see others struggling and not knowing what the future looks like is why I'm fighting today. So thank you. Thank you to our candidates uh, for those uh, compelling opening remarks. I'm going to start with a question. As we said, the questions are the same for both candidates. Each one has one minute and 45 seconds to answer, uh, and then the other will, will answer the same question. So you laid out a number of important issues from education to protecting small businesses, um, religious freedom, health care, uh, affordable housing. These are a lot of the issues that our community cares about and is impacted by. Uh, one thing that I wanted to bring up at the beginning is economic, uh, the economic question. So we have rising inflation and rising costs of goods and services. These are things that affect our community. What specific measures will you introduce to help families struggling with the rising cost of living in this area? We'll start with Mr. Salim. Um, yeah, that, thank you for that question. That's a very good question. Uh, you know, as, as many of you know, my family struggled. Uh, we, we, my dad literally worked as a dishwasher, worked his way up uh, to the head chef at a local restaurant in the city of Falls Church. And that not only taught me the value of the, the economy, uh, the value of what immigrants really value, but at the same time, when we look at how do we help folks when it comes to inflation, when it comes to the rising cost is, you know, government, our state legislatures need to look at how do we, you know, attack it from, from not only school issues, but from feeding children at the schools. Uh, is there a way we can find a way to feed all children uh, without having that be a big burden uh, on the state, on the families? That essentially reduces the cost on a family. Uh, and of course, when it comes to uh, rebates, we can definitely look at that. Uh, because right now the state has a, has, a, has a large surplus and they're going back between do we give teachers a pay raise or do we give uh, corporations a tax cut. That's where we need to look at is that corporations are not, you know, they're not taking the hit right now. It's working class families that really need the help. So the state, along with the General Assembly, needs to look at that and say, how do we utilize those funds? How do we help them? Those are some of the measures that I would look at is, A, looking at state budget, looking at surpluses and how we can give that back to communities, how we can go in, um, help out the school systems uh, by making sure that all children are fed. 
Thank you. Well, the, the question was about inflation, and I think the price of all goods is rising pretty rapidly. I think we need to look at what are the, the core essential products and how do we make those affordable to people. And probably the most essential product other than food is medicine. And the cost of medicine has been skyrocketing over the past decades. And uh, I had a bill, Senate Bill 957, which would have put caps on the price of prescription drugs in Virginia, and it worked as follows. Uh, thanks to the Manchin-Schumer Act that the Democratic Congress passed in 2021, the federal government for the first time actually negotiates prices for drugs we use in Medicare. And they will negotiate that price with the large drug companies such that the research funding and the, the manufacturing cost and the marketing cost and a return on equity is all baked into the price. And then they set what's called a UPL or upper price limit. And that UPL is public. It's out there. So we know what the UPL is for a certain drug. Let's say it's a drug to control diabetes, for example. And so we can use that information to negotiate the drugs we purchase for Medicaid, which is about $4 billion a year, we can also use it in the private market to put caps on what can be charged by private uh, insurance companies and by private uh, retailers who sell these drugs. And, you know, my wife and I, my wife's in the audience, we, her parents have lived with us for really a generation, and the cost of prescription drugs is terrible. And so that's really the number one thing we can do is pass that bill, which was Senate Bill 957. I got it through the Senate 2613 with bipartisan support. The governor opposed it. I'll bring it back next year. The second thing, and I, I'm running out of time, I do want to talk about real estate taxes. I realize it's a huge burden, particularly on folks that are on fixed income, and I'll cap, cap, catch up to that later. Thanks. Thank you. Related to inflation um, is also affordable housing. So this is a big issue for our community as well. Um, median home prices are hovering around 650 to 750,000. How do you plan to ensure that members of our community have access to safe, affordable housing? And what steps will you take to address the systemic barriers that prevent many from accessing this basic human need? And we'll begin with Mr. Peterson. Okay, thank you. And yes, affordable housing is always, always been an issue. I've, I've lived in Northern Virginia since 1968, and I think it's probably been an issue every single one of those years because we've, we've had a fairly relatively hot real estate market. I think there's a couple things we can do, and let's start with the, the most obvious is give options to local governments, uh, whether it's Fairfax County or Falls Church City or Fairfax City, uh, so that they can have the ability to create more multifamily units. Uh, they can create affordable dwelling units, maybe within the same single family lot. Again, I live in a house, we have, my wife and I have a half acre lot, we have a garage in the back that could be converted to an in-law cottage, it'd be converted to a, I see my children in the audience, I don't want to predict they're going to end up there, but I mean, there are different housing options that we can develop at the local level. One of the things I've been most excited about, and I, I kind of geek out a little bit on tax policy, is this concept called split rate taxation, where you actually vary the tax rate in certain zones, you don't tax improvements, but you tax raw land. And so you have a higher tax on raw land, which encourages people to develop and go vertically. So in other words, they build density, they go vertically, and they create more units, which can be uh, cheaper and more accessible. And if you do that around metro stops or urban centers, you're actually creating housing that can be affordable or workforce housing for, say, police or teachers or people like that that may be making, you know, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. So the bottom line is we can be more creative with our tax policy. We can be more flexible with our land use policy. I recognize not everyone's going to live in a single family, excuse me, a quarter acre single family lot like we grew up in. Uh, and so just being more flexible is one way to get at that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, as, again, as somebody whose life has been impacted by affordable housing, I definitely can say there's not enough housing. The, the key to housing is to build more housing. And of course, we're not able to just find a random lot somewhere, just, you know, put houses in neighborhoods. We first have to preserve what we have. We have to look at not only inventory uh, in the commercial side and see are those, can we convert a lot of those uh, into actual homes uh, that can be rented out. So those are some of the things we have to look at. And Richmond has the ability to allow localities to change their zoning uh, to give them the ability to make those changes on their own. And of course, when we're building homes or when we're building apartment complexes, it needs to be built around transportation system around hubs, around metro, so that it takes away the burden uh, from whoever is going to be living there of owning a car or, you know, adding the cost of insurance and all that. So those are some of the things uh, that needs to happen um, that, you know, Richmond's able to make those decisions and 
let localities determine those things. Thank you. Thank you. So staying on the economic side, we're going to talk about small businesses. Um, these are an important source of innovation and entrepreneurship and growth, economic growth for our communities um, and job creation, of course. How do you plan to foster a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship in this area to retain the talent? A lot of people are going outside of Northern Virginia. Um, and what policies do you, do you propose to encourage small business growth and development um, in this, in our district? Mm -hmm. So again, you know, the, the state has an obligation to ensure that we bring in, you know, tech companies, we bring in data centers to our communities, to our areas. And of course, when we're looking at that, you know, you look at the Tyson's area, that's been well developed uh, with a lot of companies where universities need to partner up with those uh, institutions, those companies, uh, to make sure that there's funding that comes from them uh, that allows students to thrive so that they go back into that same workforce. And of course, uh, by doing that, we're keeping the workforce here. Uh, we're also allowing small businesses that are in the area to thrive because small businesses aren't, aren't going to thrive if there's no one that's staying in the area, if no one's living here. So those are some of the things. Um, and of course, making it easier when it comes to resources that are available for small businesses. A lot of small businesses are owned by minorities uh, with immigrant background that really struggle to find uh, and go through the resources that are available by the state. That's not an easy task for somebody who's trying to start their business, somebody who's trying to uh, continue on their business. And we saw over the last couple of years during COVID that small businesses took a hit. And it wasn't just you know, you know, a small business that's been there for 10, 20 years. Like the restaurant my dad works at, it, they took a big hit. But at the same time, they had the ability from state and they had resources from tech that allowed them to stay innovative, that allowed them to stay afloat. And those are the things that the state has to look at, is making sure we make it clear what are the resources, how do we make them available to those small businesses. Well, thank you. I think you know one of the first things when you open a small business is you have to talk about tax burden. And I passed the pass-through entity taxation bill, which basically gave a, a tax cut to all small businesses by allowing them to take money they paid for their state taxes and deduct that on their federal return as a, as a business expense. So anyone that owns an LLC or a PLC or a, a family-owned or closely-owned uh, partnership, that was a tax cut for you. And I'm sure your CPA will tell you about it, but the bottom line is making sure that our folks are, are minimizing the tax burden as much as possible for small business. That's critical because small business is so mobile now that if you're in a state with a high tax burden or a locality with a high tax burden, they'll go elsewhere. The second one is regulations, and one of the ideas I had years ago, and I'm going to notice Tom Clinton, Commissioner of Revenue of Falls Church over there, is making it easier for people to get a business license, making it easier for them to get the licenses they need to open up uh, their business. Uh, let me give you a perfect example. A lot of businesses need CDLs, commercial driver's licenses. Well, the DMV was closed for a year and a half. It finally reopened because I put in a reopening provision in the state budget and said we need to reopen it for in-person service. That would allow businesses that needed CDLs for their employees to start getting back on the road again so they could get back in business. Uh, the last thing is just regulations. Um, you know, my wife and I, we own a small business. We have 14 employees. And the ability to make decisions, uh, the ability for us to, to pay our employees what they're worth, uh, the ability to frankly have the freedom as a small business to grow, uh, that's critical. And again, if Virginia's going to add jobs, small businesses have to be given freedom. I was happy to be given an award from the Virginia Chamber of Commerce, as well as uh, NFIB and other organizations that recognize my fight for small business. And I think small business is a big issue in this community. And I'm glad I did. Thanks. Thank you. We're shifting away from the economic questions. Let's talk about gun control policy. Um, Mr. Peterson, you voted no to ban assault weapons in 2020. Um, and, you know, lately there's been a string. Uh, we know every year there's just increasing numbers of mass shootings. And people say, you know, it's a matter of time before one of them uh, comes to our community. How can we protect our communities from these type of events? And what type of specific legislation would you support or not support when it comes to gun control? Sure. Well, thank you for the question. And obviously, gun control is a major topic across the United States and certainly in Virginia. And I preface by saying in 2020, we passed four major pieces of gun control legislation. We passed the red flag law, which allows us to take guns away 
uh, from people that are acting dangerously. Uh, we packed uh, criminal background checks, which will, requires every commercial transaction to go through a background check. Uh, we passed uh, the one gun a month, which reinstated the idea that you can only purchase one gun a month, which closed down the loophole for people to come into Virginia and purchase firearms. And, and we also passed local control, which allows localities to pass their own ordinances to limit firearms in public areas. Uh, House Bill 961 was a bill that we did not pass, and there were four Democratic lawyers. We all voted against it, and we passed it by. And the reason was it made uh, basically the possession of certain assault weapons, which was defined as 13 different categories of weapons, a Class 6 felony. But the problem is if people have legally purchased the weapon and they have it in their house, then it's hard to make that a felony. That would be basically a violation of due process because they become a felon as soon as you pass the law. We are in favor of a prospective ban on uh, assault weapons. We passed that in the state Senate. Uh, we'll pass that again. I agree. We need to get AR-15s off the street. They should not be sold. They do not have a sporting purpose. But one of the things I've learned, and I've been in this business 22 years, is every time you pass a criminal law, you have to think about what type of effect it'll, it'll have and what population will be applied against. And again, when you put people and make them class six felons just simply by their status, not based on any conduct that they've done, that's problematic. So the bottom line is gun control is an important issue, and we're going to get there. Um, I'm proud of what we've done in Virginia. We have more work to do. Uh, again, I think we should ban the sale of AR-15s, but the bill that we voted against, we did so for a reason. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, please. So uh, I'm going to be straightforward with, uh, with the gun control stuff. You know, since 2007, I was in high school, and that's when Virginia Tech shooting happened. For 16 years, 16 plus years, we saw across the nation more mass shooting, more gun violence than ever before. And our excuse is that when we ban assault weapons, we're going to have some people become felons. Now, the General Assembly's job is to make sure they work out the details. And that's something that, you know, some senators have failed to do. And it's not, you know, 2020, 21, 22, it's 23. That's, that's about four, almost three years that, you know, we, we have had failed leadership uh, that failed to protect children, that failed to protect people at mosques, synagogues, and at churches. You know, I live in a world that's post 9-11, and as a Muslim person, wherever I walk, I have to think about, you know, what's going to happen? Do I go to an event knowing that there's somebody that, that's going to have an AR-15? No one hunts with AR-15. No one shoots a deer. Because what happens is that the moment that bullet hits it, it splats all over wherever it's at. That's what they're using on children. And our excuse is that we don't want to make other people become felons. What about the parents? Do, do the students not have the right or to have a safe place? Do the people at the mosque, at the churches, not have the right to be at a place where they feel safe? That's where I stand. You know, when I get to Richmond, the first thing we're going to try to do is ban assault weapons. We're going to work out the difference. We're not going to make up excuses. Thank you. Uh, moving again to another topic. So uh, the Young administration published the 2022 model policies on education, which include a number of new measures that have raised the debate over parental versus student rights. Many parents in our community are concerned about their role and access to information about their children in school. To what extent do you believe that parents should be involved in and informed of such decisions impacting their children? So, you know, obviously parents have the right to know what's going on in their kid's life. They, they have the right to know everything that's happening at the school system. Um, and of course, Glenn Youngkin, you know, the governor has passed a lot of rules that are not only restricting, but also um, are essentially putting a hotline on teachers. Imagine being a teacher. Imagine, you know, getting paid less than the national average in Virginia and then having to worry about the fact that if you say something or if your students say something, you can't help them or they can't help you and you're going to get snitched on. Um, and, you know, that, that's exactly what happened. And we had no senators that said, hey, we're going to fight this. We're going to stand up for our teachers where we call them the forefront. We call them the educators for our, our children. You know, I, I grew up here. I went to our public school system. Uh, the amount of demonization that's took place over the last four or five years has, has got to be the point where we all have to look at our teachers and say, wow, they're in real danger. So again, I, I, you know, I believe that parents have the right to know what's going on at the school. 
I believe that they are, you know, parents are students' first, first teachers. You know, I, I came to this nation and learned everything through my parents, whatever they said, and they always told me school are the safest place, your teachers are the safest people that know what's going on, that will educate you and learn English from all of them. Uh, to which some of them I still stay in touch, some of them still are in the district. Um, but at the same time, they're not getting paid. You know, you have a, you have a teacher who, you know, may, uh, you know, give childbirth and has to take some months off. They're not getting their full, full uh, retirement after they retire. So those are the things we need to be worried about as well as making sure that parents are aware of all that. Um, the question was about teachers. And first of all, I, I think the question was about parental involvement. And, yeah. the sh and the short answer is yes, of course parents should be involved. I mean, who here does not think parents should be involved in their child's education? I mean, they ought to be kept up to date on what the, the grades are. They ought to be kept up to date on what they're learning. Uh, we had a bill this year actually co-sponsored with now Congresswoman Jen McClellan called Parental Backpack, in which basically you're given a scorecard about your child's academic uh, achievements as well as their test scores. It's kind of like you can track a stock. You can track your child's educational attainment. I'm not trying to analogize the two, but if you're able to look up and see how you're doing with Facebook or something else, you should be able to get the same information about your child. So we passed that legislation. It went to the governor. Notice the last thing I said was it went to the governor. And one of the things you have to learn in Richmond is it's easy for me to stand in a hall and, and make a lot of promises. Going down to Richmond and working with 140 people and a governor is a little bit different. And we did pass uh, a fairly significant pay raise, 5% a year in fiscal year one, 5% a year in fiscal year two for this budget. That was a 10% pay increase. And that was my budget amendment I put in. Now it turned out it did not keep up with inflation. So you know what? We went back to the drawing board and we put in another 2% as long as, along with a, uh, a retention bonus. And we baked that into the budget. But you know what? We can't just make it happen. The governor's a Republican. We've got to negotiate with him. And that's one of the things that after this primary is over, we're going to have to sit down and negotiate with the governor and get the best deal that we can get. You know, I'm proud that I've represented teachers. Uh, I've represented them in many different ways. And I've been endorsed by them. I've been endorsed their organizations. Um, at the end of the day, I, I do believe education is about teachers, also mostly about kids. And I, I hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about kids. Um, but hopefully that's an answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you. As a follow-up to that, as, um, to be more specific, uh, parents and community members expressed concern about bathroom policies at school, citing safety and privacy concerns. And like I mentioned, the governor has enacted some policies that limit some of the ability students to use restroom based on their sex assigned at birth. How do you address these concerns um, while, while juggling parental rights and student rights? Mr. Peterson goes first. I'm happy to let you answer that one. Um, you know, it's funny. that The world has changed pretty rapidly. This would not have been a question I would have gotten 22 years ago when I was running for the House of Delegates. Uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of these issues in the state legislature, you need to step back and let it breathe a little bit. And I think people sometimes come in with a, a one-size-fits-all legislative change. I think school boards have actually done a pretty good job of managing this. I think principals have done a pretty good job of managing this. One thing I'm always cognizant about is when I go into a school, that principal is managing that, that school. And, you know, granted, I'm a taxpayer. I have a right to be there. But by the same token, I don't second guess the people that are on the front lines. And the folks that are principals, their teachers, uh, and even school board members, they're making these decisions. I think our job in the state legislature is to provide funding is to decide what the standards of quality should be, decide what the academic standards should be. And in terms of these sort of issues about who's going into what bathroom stall, we really shouldn't be micromanaging that. I think that's an area where we need to let the issue breathe a little bit and let those folks that are on the scene make those decisions. Okay. Um, again, you know, I, I believe that students need to feel safe at a place that they attend, and those are schools. Um, and, and just as much as anybody else, they have the right to to have policies in place that will not only protect them, but also encourage them to be who they are. And when we talk about the, the bathroom policies, when we talk about, uh, we're specifically talking about the LGBTQ uh, community uh, that's been under attack for over many, many years. Again, th those are the same communities that have stood with you know, me, with a lot of our folks uh, when the Muslim ban took place. Uh, they stood behind us for, for a lot of things that the community took uh, in during the years. 
it's time where you know we come to terms to stand behind them along with making sure that when policies continue to get under attack that the where you know their personal rights are being attacked that's the moment where we need to relook at that and say are we oppressing someone else's right or are we taking into consideration that we are preventing someone else from having the same rights that we fought for for many many years so that that's where i stand and of course letting our school boards decide what they want to do uh, making sure you know they get the funding from Richmond that they deserve and not where there's threats to funding that may be held back uh, or you know there may be litigation in that sense um, when it comes to funding because of policies uh, that the local school boards um, have put in place and to that point local school board members over the years they took in so much and this is a you know they're, they're doing their thing for essentially for free uh, giving up their time to ensure that policies that matter to every community um, is in place. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to turn to the audience. Um, Safe will help me field some questions from the audience. So, um, please. see this we call them crazy we call them old names that they carry a rifle and go to the school and massacre so many children and uh, s teachers I don't know why the NRA yeah have overpower the government and they pass their rules then what is our government good for just collect taxes there must be some rules to control the arms to save the lives that we are proud to see them graduate from the school like any other person and not to lose that good opportunity. And thank you very much. So the question is about the role of lobbyists like the NRA um, in our government. Okay. Well, I, I think, you know, the question was about basically people that, you know, having too much power in government. And, uh, you know, one of the things I've seen is, is lobbyists is a cycle. And, for example, when I first came down, to the legislature, you know, the NRA was very powerful. Dominion power, uh, Dominion power was very powerful, and they were. Excuse me. Well, what I was going to say is, it, it it actually sometimes goes back the other way. For example, Dominion power, we've actually cut back on their power. We've put more regulations on them. The NRA, we've passed multiple gun control bills that they've opposed. Again, you know, if you look at Virginia right now, our gun control laws are not much different than, say, Maryland. And uh, the problem is that there are issues uh, when you create, anytime you create a new criminal statute, you have to think about, okay, if I create a new criminal statute, let me give you an example. You know, on the, on the uh, criminal background check bill. Criminal background check bill deals with commercial transactions. The original version had to do with any transfer. Well, let's say, for example, you inherit, your father dies, and you inherit maybe a shotgun from your father, and then you give it to your adult son. Well, those would be two transfers. Should that be a felony? So again, you have to be careful with criminal laws that you make sure you don't capture what would otherwise be innocent behavior. But that's not what the lobbyists, I mean, the lobbyists is your question is, eventually the lobbyist power comes and goes. The people like you speaking, uh, being in the community, talking to your elected representatives, that's more important than a lobbyist. That, that's, the, that's my honest opinion. Again, I, I want to respond back to that. You know, the NRA has been here for, for a long time, and they have continued to, uh, to essentially control a lot of the policies that take place, along with put in funds to go against candidates that will continue to fight for uh, preventing gun violence, that will continue to fight to prevent them from doing what they've been doing, is, you know, when you look at the NRA, they're the ones that have been able to allow folks to carry AR-15s because they're using the Second Amendment rights, which you know we're not trying to take away. We're just saying let's make it safer for communities. Let's make it safer for a place like this. Um, you know, every every time I go to a mosque and my dad asks, you know, where are you going, he will tell me like, just be careful. We know what's going on in the world. Um, and you know, that wasn't a thing five, six years ago. That's the thing now. And as I'm on this campaign, he tells me the same thing every day. You go to you go to a door, you be careful. Uh, and that's been a consistent thing. Um, you know, when we're talking about big corporations impacting policies. We're also talking about the fact that none of our elected officials are fighting back as hard. 
Um, you may hear, you know, from, from senators, um, even some uh, on the stage right here, is that, you know, it's always excuses about why we can't do something, why we can't do it. There's about 13 states, including the District of Columbia, that has banned assault weapons. I'm not asking anyone to reinvent the wheel. I'm asking, look at all the other states, look at all the other places that has done it. We can take that into consideration, redo ours. And again, it's the General Assembly's job to make sure those detailed fine prints are worked out. We're not saying we're just gonna put two line and pass a bill. We're saying we're gonna work out the difference, make sure it's, it works, make sure it protects the public, make sure it's a public safety issue. somebody with, with affordable housing background, not just the word, uh, I lived through it, um, I, I would support that idea. Uh, and the reason I say this is because we need to figure out a way, where is the backlog? Where, you know, is it the county level? Is it the state? Uh, is it, do we need to bring all the developers, all the county folks, um, and the state in the same place to say, here's what we're gonna do. Um, if we were able to come up with the difference in funding, um, and you were able to reduce the number of days that somebody has to wait to get their affordable housing unit or for a construction to be done, if that could be significantly reduced, then they can tap into those funds. They get, they get the, uh, the funds available to them uh, that they can use for schools, they can use for even more affordable housing. Um, and again, my, my family waited about two, maybe two and a half years just to get a call to say, hey, there's a, there's a unit that's available. And at the end, you know, when we left, uh, when we purchased our own home, we you know, we left immediately so that it could be available to somebody else that may have been waiting for years. So that, that's where I come from is that I would support that. Again, affordable housing isn't gonna get, you know, solved by just politicians talking about it. It's gonna require bringing everyone to the table, having those awkward conversations, whether it's a Republican governor or a Democratic governor, to solve the real issues. And of course, when we're building affordable housing sort of, you know, 10, 20 miles away from here, we also need to look at transit system um, how do we get transit out there as well? So those are some of the things that I look forward to working on, uh, not just with developers, but also with localities. Um, and, you know, the Dillon rule is something that, you know, we're going to have to look at as well. Uh, I guess I begin by saying we do have a Virginia Housing Trust Fund. It's about $50 million. It's a revolving fund, but it, it's not a lot. I think the number one thing we could do to help you is just reduce red tape. I mean, from the time you submit a site plan or you, time you submit maybe a comp plan amendment, it's taken months, it's taken years, and oftentimes you miss the market. And I've had many clients like you that they bought a piece of ground, it was a great investment, but by the time the plans got improved and they wanted to go into the ground with the steel, the, the economy had changed, the interest rates went up. And so reducing red tape and having a quicker turnaround within our zoning offices and our planning offices is probably the number one thing we can do. You know, the other thing, and, and I'm, I'm speaking to you personally, like what has really changed the dynamic out in the outer counties is, of course, data centers. They've driven up the price of land incredibly, and they're using up all the water, and they're using up all the electricity. So it's the number one environmental issue in Virginia right now is the growth of data centers, and they are taking resources that could otherwise support living human beings. Okay, so that would be the other thing you would say, and, I, and I've... 
this is a battle we're going to have to have with the governor. And I, I need to sort of change hearts and minds on this issue because he wants to spend $35 billion to bring in more data centers from Virginia, typically through Amazon. And what that will do is essentially take up all of the power grid and all of the water out in Prince William and Falk here, and it's just going to drive out the population. So those are some of the issues. Um, it's a huge issue. Look, folks, we'll always need housing. Uh, we'll need it in the inner suburbs. We'll need it in the outer suburbs. Part of a growing community is you always need to have new housing. And the number one thing is you've got to be able to go in and get those permits and, and get those site plans approved. Thank you. You can come up here and project. This mic? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. So I have a very specific question. One of one of the biggest challenges that I see in, in this community and as a nation as a whole is workforce development. I know there is a huge funds uh, nationwide and also in Virginia available for workforce development to compete against you know global economy and whatnot. One of the biggest challenges that I've, that I've seen in that fund is the allocation of that fund and the distribution of that fund is focused mainly on democratics, uh, democratics where it's focused on ages, they go, they go to high schools, they, the outreach are focused on high schools and colleges and, and community colleges and whatnot, but not on different, uh, I would personally think it's more it should be outreach program towards immigrant communities. Historically, immigrant communities has been, you know, very hard contributors to, uh, you know, to economies across the world, especially in the United States. So my question is, what is your stance on allocation of uh, and appropriations of workforce, workforce development funds? First of all, I I'm going to be a typical politician and take your question and use it to say something I wanted to say anyway. Um, but that's a great question, workforce development. And let me segue into an issue I've wanted to talk about, and I've talked about a little bit in the campaign. I'm going to talk about more. Uh, when I go back, and that is this issue of revitalizing community colleges. We have a system of community colleges that we built out in the 60s and 70s in Virginia that is wildly underutilized. And I know uh, my colleague had went to community college, and obviously it played a beneficial role in his life. But one of the things we really have missed is that we've had a huge drop-off in people that are going to go to college, and a lot of that is demographics. We have fewer 18-year-olds than we have 65-year-olds in this state in a couple years, and no one's really planned for that. And we also have a generation that's coming up that doesn't want to go to college. Maybe they don't think college fits them. And the question is, how do we get them into a profession where they can support a family, they can be taxpayers, they can be members of society? And I think the easiest way to do that is to take the existing infrastructure that we have in our community college system, make it free. Okay, so people aren't paying. They're not trying to come up with money to do this, do that. But we'll just make it free. I mean, it's about $300 million in our budget, which, frankly, we could wrap into our surplus and then use that to train people for careers. Maybe it's an electrician, maybe it's a computer science engineer, maybe it's a plumber, uh, but use them, or, or a welder, bring the unions in and have them be part of an apprenticeship program. So they come out of community college with a certificate, go right into an apprenticeship program. So we need to use our existing infrastructure at community colleges. I think it's the best way to do it. You know, I've been thinking about this for years, and uh, honestly, I just feel like it's the best way to do it and the best way to tackle that issue. Thanks for the question. No, uh, that, again, that's a very good question, workforce uh, uh, development. It's, it's something that where, you know, I see a lot of my friends, they go into tech, they go into other different areas. Uh, but when I started this campaign, I looked at, you know, A, somebody that went to community college, what can we do there along with looking at unions? So labor unions already have a lot of these programs in place uh, where they will let, you, let somebody come in, they will let you learn the, 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 the stuff that you want to learn from welding uh, to being a plumber to being an electrician while you're getting paid. Uh, and that's something that I think, you know, uh, we may disagree up, up here is that the only way a lot of labor unions can thrive along with making sure there are uh, programs that can continue is by having companies that will come in. When we talk about data centers, when we talk about um, other firms that are coming in, a lot of jobs are attached to that that are already being trained by uh, labor unions at the moment, but labor unions are so limited to what they can do because we don't uh, have, you know, we're, we're not repealing right to work. Uh, and that's where it matters the most is that we're not allowing labor unions to collectively bargain on behalf of their uh, union members. 
which is going to essentially reduce the cost on them along with making sure they get the fair share of what they deserve when it comes to uh, getting paid. Um, and of course, you know, uh, uh, you know, my colleague up here uh, brought up the data center is that why are we afraid of change? If it's an environmental issue, we can look at that. We can work out the difference with the data center companies, but it also brings in thousands of jobs. Um, if it's about clean water, if it's about battlefield, I don't know what it is, uh, but we can hash out those differences. If it's about buildings that don't look great, we can work out those differences, and that's going to allow workforce areas, workforce housing to be developed so that it's around areas uh, that are being developed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Um, I am an attorney, and one of the areas that I focus on is employment discrimination um, and civil rights in general, but this is a very popular uh, practice for me, specifically from the Muslim community in a post-9-11 um, environment. Um, I have a, a specific question to, to Senator Peterson. I want to give you an opportunity to just kind of like provide a context that maybe we don't have. Um, and that's about um, your vote on Senator McClellan's uh, uh, employment discrimination uh, bill. Um, if you could just provide some context with that. And to tell us what can you do, because this is a very serious issue that touches members of this community, what can you do or do you foresee or would like to do in order to strengthen protections and provide avenues for people who are agreed to, to seek legal redress for the discrimination that they face? Okay. I don't, you, you said discriminating on the basis of religion is already illegal in Virginia. If you could explain your vote on, on the, the, the extended language that Senator McClellan had proposed. Okay, I'd probably vote on 25,000 bills. Which, which bill was this? And which year was it, too? <laughs> so uh, this was if part of the Virginia Human Rights Act in 2021. Okay, that would have the one, I think, that lowered the standard and made it more easy to sue small business. That bill? <laughs> well, I, I think what you're talking about was there was a bill that took most Human Rights Act, basically the standard goes down from 25, it's at 25, and they brought it down to 5. And that was a bill that I think, I don't think we've, I can't remember exactly what we did. It didn't pass, and this was in the Democratic legislature. But the idea was it would have opened the door for more lawsuits, uh, and in particular against small businesses, like businesses that go down to, to five people. And uh, I think the idea was that would have been a burden. Um, Title VII discrimination is illegal right now, and, and it has been illegal. Discriminating on the basis of race is illegal right now. You, I got asked a question about small business uh, a little while ago, and one of the biggest burdens for small businesses is, of course, getting sued. Um, and so I think the idea was that legislation, and again, I'm not operating alone here. If it didn't pass, there was other people involved. That legislation would have opened the door for a lot more lawsuits that, frankly, would have, would have harmed small business. And, and let me just step aside for small business. One of the things I've been an advocate for is a lot of the sweeping mandates that we put on larger businesses, we don't have that same mandate for small business. And I have a feeling that most folks in this community would be fine with it. They own like a restaurant or they own a, a small business. Uh, they don't want to be told, you know, exactly how they have to run that business by the government. So. I, you were a little bit vague in your question, sir. I think if you had been more precise, it might not have been a, a, a favorable response because, to be honest, I think that bill would have put a significant burden on small business, and that's probably why it got voted down. So, uh, I mean, again, I, I, I commend my colleague for protecting small businesses. Um, but at the same time, you know, committee hearings are there for a reason. You pass bills, you have a couple of days to hash out the difference. But when it really comes to employee discrimination, there, there is something that, you know, I, I try to leave off of this camp, campaign on a personal level is that when I got out of college, you know, I, I was given the advice, apply to 100 jobs, two will call you back, one will give you an interview, and maybe, maybe a job. And that's exactly what happened. Um, as somebody who lived in the post 9/11 uh, era, it was it was very hard. Uh, to the point, again, some some of the media that's here, the main find out about this right now is that 
it, it came to a point where I think I didn't realize the discrimination that we face in the corporate world is real. Uh, is that you know I, I had a different different name that I had to change, uh, which allowed where a, a specific company did not hire me, but the moment it was changed, offered me a job. That that in itself is discrimination that I have lived through. Uh, that I can say, you know, we need to strengthen a lot of those rules. We need to make sure that we not only watch out for small businesses from getting sued, we also take care of people that are being, t you know, taken advantage over uh, by the big corporations. So that, that's just something personal that I haven't really shared with a lot of people. But every day, you know, I look at jobs. When I apply to jobs, I have to think about, is this a, a firm that's going to hire me or are they going to use the same criteria that they used before 2016? Thank you. Um, Mr. Peterson, I'm going to ask you the next question. You voted to enshrine the IR IHRA definition of anti-Semitism recently. This was signed by Governor Yunkin. It includes a number of examples that seek to criminalize criticism of Israel and its policies against Palestinians. Can you explain why you voted for this and if you would vote for a di similar um, uh, legislation that defines Islamophobia? Well, the answer to the second question is yes, and I, I've talked to the, about bringing that forward. You said criminalize, and that's not accurate. It was a Section 1 bill, and a Section 1 bill basically expresses the sentiment of the Senate, or in this case, the General Assembly. Uh, we did not put it in the state code. It was a Section 1 bill, so it did not go in the state code. We did not make it part of the criminal code. You know, there's sometimes, as a politician, you have to make tough choices, and we've had a number of anti-Semitic incidents, just like we've had anti-Muslim incidents. And we had a bill brought forward to condemn anti-Semitism and make it a separate criminal penalty. And that's tough because I have a lot of Jewish constituents and friends, and they're like, well, wh wh why don't you vote for this? Aren't you, don't you support Jewish people? Aren't you opposed to anti-Semitism? I said, yes, but if we carve this one out, it's almost like you've got to do one for every group. And so we defeated that bill, and then we had another bill come back that basically asked us to condemn anti-Semitism in what's called a Section 1 bill. So it's not part of the criminal code. It's just expressing the sentiment. And I realize a lot of people say, well, why are you even getting involved with this? And it's tough. Uh, like I said, I, you know, everyone asks me about my vote, so they don't ask my colleague about his voting record because he doesn't have one. And that's fine. I get that. Um, but the problem is sometimes as a politician, you have to make tough choices and people are going to be angry at you. And I had a lot of Jewish friends who were angry at me because I didn't vote for the first bill. And I've got folks in, in the community that say, well, why would you vote for the second bill? Um, we were trying to find a balance. I think we wanted to make a statement against anti-Semitism. I did not want to put it in the criminal code. I did not want to make it an elevated penalty vis-a-vis -vis a, a different type of uh, uh, hate crime. And I'll simply say to your second question, yes. If the Islamic community said to me, let's define Islamophobia, let's do a Section 1 bill that would be equivalent, I'd carry the bill myself. Thank you. Thanks. So um, since you're, I can't ask you about your voting record, but I can ask you about what you plan to vote on and how you plan to address issues of hate crimes and Islamophobia, anti-Semitism specifically. Uh, you said you kind of experienced some of that. You know our community experiences. it. What are some tangible things you plan to propose to, to address these issues that are a big concern? No, um, of course, you know, as, again, <laughs> I feel like when I put myself in this campaign, there's a lot of things that opened up uh, as being a South Asian American uh, as a Muslim American, it, it really, you know, there was anti-Asian hate. Uh, there was a, a lot of attacks on Muslims across the nation. Uh, you know, I, I go through airport security like it's, you know, I'm going to get selected no matter what happens. That's just the reality, and I'm used to it. Uh, you know, I pack as little as possible. Um, so, the, you know, when we look at uh, what was passed and what was voted on, why, why didn't we include all the other ones? That's, that's really the problem is that we single out a specific group, a specific definition, where it shouldn't have been where we include all the other ones. Um, if it was, you know, something's going to get criminalized and something wasn't, those are the difference. Again, I, I just, I, I get that the Senate and the, uh, the, I'm sorry, the General Assembly meets about 45 days. Perhaps we have to look at the fact that they can't get anything done in 45 days if it's, oh, it's going to be a, a criminal penalty for something. Let's go ahead and pass it on to the next uh, session. Perhaps we look at the fact that we need to extend uh, our General Assembly's time along with making that a full-time job, making that something else. So that's where we really need to look at. And again, um, you know, I have to look at the fact that, you know, if I have kids, if I, you know, my niece is born, if we have, you know, the next generation, are they going to be uh, going through the same hate that I have gone through? 
So those are some of the things that I would look at and look at from a state perspective, uh, work at the national level along with working with localities to ensure that not only do we put safety measures but also put in bills that not only make sense but we detail them out to the point where no one's going to be a criminal coming out of it. Okay, thank you. I do want to touch on a couple more issues. Um, we did uh, come across the issue of public transit. We've had some challenges, especially in this area. We also had some tragic uh, pedestrian accidents. So how are, what are your plans to address public transit, expand public transit options, especially in low-income and marginalized communities, um, and make it accessible for all residents? Um, so with public transit system itself, like I, when I did, when I started my master's in 2013, we talked about extend, getting a metro extension out to the, to the uh, airport, and that just took place in, you know, less than a year ago. That was essentially about seven years. It took that long. So it's, it's a regional problem. It's where we have to work with our counterparts. Uh, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia have to come together to ensure that we can, we can uh, expand our routes um, and the other thing is, uh, WMATA took into consideration that their bus systems aren't really geared towards getting high uh, users, so they're taking out a lot of their uh, services over the years. That's an opportunity for Fairfax Connector to say, we know where the people are, uh, we need to work collectively to expand those routes. Um, and of course, with Fairfax Connectors, nothing really happens without the, the bus driver's union, where if they don't, you know, when we get them to the table and they're not getting their rights, they're not getting their sick leave, like you have a bus driver who has to be there at 7 a.m. in the morning till you know, late in the day, if he's out or she's out sick for just one day, that whole route is kind of gone. So those are some of the rights that are not given to them in their collective bargaining. So we also have to look at how do we make sure it's driver friendly? How do we make sure that the resources from Richmond come down here to ensure that everyone gets their fair share of the deal and of course, you know, I, w I would like to see a world where, you know, instead of on 66 building toll roads, we have a metro going all the way down to Haymarket, to all the way down to Winchester, uh, and that's going to allow a lot of people to use public transit, and building those around not only workforce uh, housing, but also new developments is going to help people um, from a general sense of finding transportation where you can just hop on a bus, bus or a train and come to D.C. and go all the way down to Richmond without feeling that burden of I got to go to a car, I'm going to get stuck on 95. Okay, well, I, I think it's important to know the fiscal reality. It's about a billion dollars for a linear mile of fixed rail. So if we took the orange line from Vienna and built it out to Haymarket, that would be about $15 billion. That would basically be our K-12 budget for three years. Okay, so I mean, that is a staggering amount of money. And we just can't afford to do everything, folks. I think one of the things we need to do is look at more, uh, uh, more cost-efficient options such as bus rapid transit. Look at ways that we can get buses on dedicated lanes. You know, one of the things we did about building I-66 was we didn't use taxpayer money. We used creative financing. We created more lanes. We put in lanes for buses and bus rapid transit so you can get downtown. Look, the I-66 construction sucked, okay? I get it. Quote me. But, you know, at the same time, that's an asset that our community is going to have for years going forward. All right, that's important. People have to make these investments, but they have to make smart investments. The other smart investment that we have to make is, again, incentivizing density around these stops. If you look at the way Vienna Metro was originally built, and this was planned back in the 70s and 80s, so don't blame me. I was in high school. There's not enough density. There's not enough retail. There's not enough office. So instead, you have people driving, parking in a surface lot, and then walking into a a metro station. That doesn't make any sense. Now we got a little bit smarter when we planned Tyson's. We got a little bit smarter when we planned Reston. But the bottom line is creative land use and, and smart land use is the best way to do it. But just simply extending the met metro line, that's going to leave us broke. And we just don't have the density out in Haymarket to support an orange line extension. That's just not common sense. So I think we have to be smart in order to get the most use out of our dollars. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, going back to the economy uh, question and how it affects individuals, uh, let's be a little bit more specific. This is an audience question that was submitted online. Um, will you commit to tax reform such as a wealth tax on 
assets that ed equitably taxes the abundant resources of the top 1% of the population in order to fund services necessary for a thriving society? And also, do you support an increase in the minimum wage in Virginia and to what number? I, I'll get oh, that. I'm sorry. So the first one was, do you support it, or, or the increase in the minimum wage was the second question. The first question was, do you support a wealth tax? Mm -hmm. uh, let me take the minimum wage first. The short answer is yes. Uh, we increased the minimum wage in Virginia uh, up to $15 an hour. Uh, that is, I believe, going to take effect in 2025. We're about two-thirds of the way there. Um, it had been $7.25, and I think that was a significant victory for the Democrats to get that and walk that up. I know we had different ideas, such as having a re different regional uh, minimum wages. I didn't like that because basically it's saying that certain regions of our state were going to stay poor, and, and that's not fair. Um, in terms of a wealth tax, I'm not sure of a state that's done that successfully. Uh, you know, one of the problems, it's just a reality of modern-day America, is if you tax people's assets, not assets that they use. Now, obviously, you can tax their real estate. They'll leave. They'll move to other states. And so I think we have to be smarter in the way we tax people. Uh, we do have an income tax system that needs to be updated. I agree with that. One of the things we need to do is increase the minimum standard deduction. Right now, under the federal uh, law, the first $25,000 you make as a married couple is not taxed. But we have that up at 18000 or excuse me, 16000 right now in Virginia. If we moved it up to twenty five, every single person... Uh, would receive a tax break, and of course it would be pro rata. It would go more to people at the bottom end. Um, so, I, you know, in terms of a wealth tax, I'm not quite sure how that's been successfully implemented. I will tell you right now, folks, if you did something like that, 98% of it probably would come out of Northern Virginia. So, I think you want to be careful what you wish for uh, if you do approve that type of taxation system. Yeah. Again, with the minimum wage, I think the. The, the State Senate and the, and the, and the House of Delegates, uh, they celebrated that they got minimum wage above the, the, what it was in the past. Um, and, you know, they really have to ask, like, are people able to afford what the new minimum wage? By the time people fight for, you know, let's get it to 15, with inflation, we should really be fighting for 20. So, yeah, I, I would support uh, raising the minimum wage. I know we have to look at a lot of, economic, uh, of economics of how to do this. And, of course, it's going to impact a lot of not only localities but businesses across the Commonwealth. But that's something we owe it to the people that are in the Commonwealth. We owe it to people that are living every single day working 80 to 90 hours a week or, you know, every two weeks to make ends meet. We owe it to the immigrant community. We owe it to students. We owe it to people that say, hey, I want to come in here and go, go to work. I want to get into the workforce. Uh, that's where it really comes out to. A lot of things is that, you know, students graduate, uh, the wealthy uh, they, they don't really care about the fact that whether the minimum wage is seven fifty or or, or five bucks or or twenty dollars because it does not impact them at the end of the day when it comes to inflation when it comes to anything there's still food at the table there's they're still surviving it's the working class that's taking the hit and they've been taking the hit for many many years and of course when it comes to our tax codes uh, in the state of Virginia yeah we we have one of the lowest taxes when it comes to uh, not only small businesses, but also big corporations, and we need to look at that. I get that we can attract more businesses when they, you know, they come to us uh, because of our low taxes, but at the same time, when it comes to personal taxes, we haven't even updated that for, for decades. So those are some of the things that we have to look at um, in seeing how the state can effectively make those changes without causing a burden on people. Thank you. Um, we mentioned a little bit about climate change, and um, I want to specifically talk about clean energy investments. How how do we plan? How do you plan to leverage some of this to create uh, jobs in this community? It's all related to the economy and workforce development as well, um, and and support local businesses, especially in in underserved areas. Um, again, as, as somebody who's been displaced because of climate change, uh, that, that's a personal issue and it's, it's very important. Uh, but when it comes to the state itself, in the, in the past, the state has an obligation to make these changes. Uh, they, they passed a bill that would allow people to get uh, a credit when they buy an electric vehicle or uh, energy efficient. They passed the bill, but they never funded it. That's what I mean. Like, you got 45 days to get all that work done and they forgot to put the funding uh, and they still haven't funded that. So those are some of the things I believe we have to go back and say we're going to fund these programs. Um, along with, you know, 
making sure we allow localities uh, to determine a lot of the, uh, the incentives that they're going to receive if they go environmental friendly, if they make their buildings uh, LEED certified and so on. And of course, um, when it comes to, uh, again, making sure that we're fighting for the environment, uh, we, we have to do it not, at le not only at the local level, but at the state level, um, along with working with our national partners um, and making sure we have the resources. We have to be able to tap into federal fundings that our governor you know, assumes he's not going to tap into. Uh, we look at, we talk about, hey, we're going to get to carbon neutral by 2050, but we're not passing bills to upgrade our electric grid system where that's where we're headed. And that's the real issue here is that we're fighting over a, a clean car act that the Republicans are trying to repeal when we should be fighting and saying we need to set standards for our electric companies to upgrade the grid system so that it can handle the energy consumption that's going to take, uh, that, that's going to, that's going to take from the grid itself. And that's where, when we have data centers, when we have companies that come in, those are the negotiations and the deals we have to make. And that's something that I look forward to doing. All right, well, the question was about clean energy and how can we capture jobs from that. I mean, we've passed some significant legislation in Virginia, uh, the Virginia Clean Economy Act, uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, all of which basically leverage clean energy policies and incentivize power plants and other industrial users to go green. Uh, one of the bills that I had a decade ago was the Solar Freedom Act, which basically said homeowners associations could not prohibit solar panels. I mean, it seemed kind of obvious, but you had homeowners associations in their bylaws that would not allow solar panels, and just simply getting rid of that and making that unenforceable made a huge uptick in the sale of solar panels. Um, one of the number one things we can do is open up the grid. Uh, we have basically for the last decades, generations, had one power company in Virginia that's provided all the power east of 81, and that's Dominion Power, Dominion Resources, and they've had a monopoly, and they've had a monopoly system. They own the lines, they own the power plants, they own the retail poles, they, they bring the power right to your door. And I've fought them. I've fought them every step of the way. I've tried to limit their power in Richmond. I've, for the last couple of years, I've actually been successful. And one of my ideas is, what if we disaggregated the system? What if we actually allowed people to come in and say, maybe they used a, a farm, maybe they used their industrial building, they had solar panels, and they could sell it on the grid for a profit. This country is all about making money, folks. If you give people a profit incentive and a profit motive, they'll figure out a way to make it happen, and you can open up the grid, and you can have more energy producers, not just users. Now, let's talk about the user side. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit of a teasing criticism of my colleague that he's basically adopting the Glenn Youngkin position on data centers. Data centers are already 20% of our energy load in Virginia. They're going to eat up all of this power. They're going to eat it all up, and people are, are not going to have farms. They're not going to be able to grow food, and that's a little bit of a problem. Okay. Well, that's all for the questions. We're going to allow you to make some closing statements, so we'll begin with Mr. Salim first. Uh, first, I really want to thank the moderator, the audience, and of course, uh, Senator Chad Peterson, uh, MOVE, along with Darrell Hidra, for hosting tonight's forum. For the first time in 16 years, uh, the new district will get an opportunity to elect a leader that will represent their best interest. In my professional work, I have worked in banking, compliance, in federal finance, and budget, negotiated terms, and worked with both small and big companies while working in the democratic space as co-chair for South Asians for America, chaired the Providence District Democratic Committee, and of course, second vice chair for the 8th Congressional District Democratic Committee, helped Fairfax County Democratic Committees find um, and start their API and Black Caucus where minority uh, representation was missing. And of course, I'm focused on building communities and being a leader for Virginia's future. As your senator, I will fight to prevent gun violence to protect and expand health care, protect all people's rights, including LGBTQ, and of course, fight for affordable housing, affordable education, and fight for the environment. My life experience coming to America, going through a journey that seemed like it was a very long struggle, has given me the ability to not only run for this, but also give the investment back to the people that got me to where I am today. And I believe in doing right by the people matters to me and that's why I'm the right candidate in this race. And it's time that we elect a leader for Virginia's future, not the past. Thank you. 
Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for listening, and I, I hopefully some folks out there are going to be watching this on the video stream, and people that haven't seen me before or seen my colleague before will get a chance to, to hear from us, because this is an important election. It's, you know, this county's changed a lot since when I grew up here in the 1980s, but some things have not changed, and that is people come here to work hard. They work hard and they succeed. And my colleague made a point that I'm going to disagree with, and that is he said the legislature maybe ought to be full-time. Don't do that. Okay, you all want to get rid of me. Okay, but don't make it full-time, and here's why. The fact that you have to go out every morning and work a real job, that you have to come home, that you have to balance uh, a payroll, that you have to know what it's like to be a small business owner, that's a key part of our identity in Virginia. And you know what? We are a pro-business state, and I don't cry about that. That's, it's good. And the reason why is because a lot of us are out there trying to run a small business. And my colleague over there was talking about the difficulties in getting site plans approved and getting uh, housing started. I, you know, I know that because I have clients going through that. Now, that's half of what I want to talk about, and that is the importance of having a professional background where you're out in the community and you're representing people. The other half I didn't have a chance to talk about, but I'm glad my children are here tonight. And being a dad is the most important thing in my life. And to see my children succeed, it, 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 that means everything to me. And, you know, we had a situation a couple years ago where our schools were closed for a year. And I saw the impact it had on our children. I saw the impact it had on my children. And you know what? I, I didn't care. I was like, we have got to get these schools back open because it's in the best interest of kids. And I, people were like, you're crazy, chap. You're not going to win for re-election. That's unpopular. And I said, you know what? It's okay. Because if it's good for kids, then it's good. And I'm just one of these people that I, I, I look at the children in our community, and I see my own children. And just seeing them succeed, seeing them have the same chances I had, yes, they're growing up in a different community. I respect that. Yes, I respect the fact that Saddam can run and should be respected as a South Asian. I respect that. I'm married to an immigrant. But at the end of the day, you've got to represent someone who's going to get something done in Richmond. I've got a record of getting things done, and God willing, I'll keep doing it for another four years. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. A round of applause for the candidates, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank again Senator Chap Peterson for joining us, for Saddam Salim for joining us. Can we get a round of applause for our moderator, please? So uh, the, the, we did live stream, uh, and we will also be providing both campaigns uh, a full video, kind of once our, our folks finish an edit of the, like the, all the cameras. We'll be providing it to the campaigns, hopefully this evening, maximum tomorrow, uh, so that you all can share what you like uh, from that. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, folks. Look out for more of these forums. We're going to be doing them across the three jurisdictions that MOVE is, is, is working in. Uh, and, and please join us for more. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good evening.